as previously directed, the Ginsburg Center for European Studies. Um, Professor Mayer has held a uh, Humboldt Research Prize, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, and uh, trust me, the list goes on and on, so I'm not going to read it all. His books include Among Empires, uh, American Ascendancy and its Predecessors, Dissolution, the Crisis of Communism in the End of East Germany, In Search of Stability, Exploration of Historical Political Economy, and his first book, a uh, classic in the field, I'm sure they all are, but that's one I remember, <laughs> Recasting Bourgeois Europe, Stabilization in France, Germany, and Italy in the decade after World War I. He has recently published uh, Leviathan 2.0, Inventing Modern Statecraft, just this year, and is currently working on a history of the idea of territory, which we will hear about today. And the title of the talk has had a, a last minute change, and it was Once Within Borders, Constructions of Territory Since 1500. Please welcome Professor Schultz. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you uh, uh, to Queen's uh, History Department for inviting me here. Uh, what you'll get today is a perspective view of a, this is a book, which is, the title is pretty fixed, the subtitle keeps wandering, uh, which I hope to, uh, to present to uh, the editors by uh, the springtime of this year. Since I'm always years late, and, uh, things, you need not hold your breath, but you'll hear what's coming. Uh, let me start with a tract in international politics that was written in the last days of the Second World War by Carl Schmitt, the nomos of the earth. By nomos, Schmitt meant a sort of meta law, a normative concept for world order that was the implicit basis for international law. Reflecting on the British and American triumph over Imperial Germany in 1918, and the impending American victory over the Third Reich, he was writing this as bombs were falling on Berlin, uh, uh, Schmidt separated two forms of empire, the extensive organization of domination and economic control he called Großraumwirtschaft, uh, or great spatial uh, economy, based on subjugation of land masses, huge but finite, and embodied in German visions of continentalist geopolitics as represented by Karl Haushofer and Hitler's Third Reich. And he separated that from an Anglo-American project for economic and global capitalist domination, as he saw it, an empire based not on control of the land, but the oceans, and by financial and economic supremacy. Schmidt was a reactionary and at times pro-Nazi theorist, but he might well have been critiquing from the perspective of the anti-capitalist, contemporary anti-capitalist left, a project for hegemonic globalization as represented by Woodrow Wilson and his earlier projects for the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles. Schmidt felt he was at the threshold of something new and rather unwelcome. The German bid for Großraumwirtschaft was crashing in flames and would be succeeded by an American domination without borders. In effect, Schmidt was suggesting that an Anglo-American <coughs> hegemonic order based on a post-territorial form of economic capitalist domination was far more oppressive, but it would prevail over the alternative of territorial imperium of which the Third Reich was the latest, had been the latest incarnation. Now, Schmidt's meditation at the moment of Gerda Demol can serve to introduce the study I'm trying to complete on the history of modern territoriality the concepts and usages for division of the globe into political and economic units. I propose to present today an abbreviated version of the ideas behind this current project, uh, entitled, as you can see, Once Within Borders, the history of the ideas and practices that constitute a territory since roughly 1500. Territory here refers simply to politically enclosed or at least identifiable regions of its space within boundaries, uh, its bordered global space, the finite surface of the earth carved up by frontiers, whether by sea or land. Uh, territories are portions of the earth's surface as divided into jurisdictions that, uh, that which are characterized by, the, by these uh, 
frontier lies. Until recently, we have taken the fact that such divisions exist for granted as a constant of life. The specific boundary lines may change, whether by peaceful means or violence, but the fact of territorial division seems as old as political organization. We've never had a world state. And in fact, and this is the premise of my work, territory and the properties that territory entails, so-called territoriality, have changed over time and continue to change profoundly. They have a history. My starting point is the recognition that territory is not simply a permanent condition of political life, but a resource and an institution that is continually and profoundly changing. And indeed, as it changes, it exerts a deep shaping force on the institutions that depend on it. How it is changing, I will suggest at the end. For now, we can note that on the one hand, the developments we describe as globalization suggest that territories are weakening into a sort of late capitalist flux of capital and labor. Even as on the other hand, groups hitherto deprived of territorial states would seek urgently to attain it, whether ethnically related peoples such as Kurds or religiously <coughs> inspired believers, believers such as ISIS. We sense front that our frontiers are imperiled by dreadful new diseases, religious fanaticism, and adverse climate change menaces that transgress all the boundaries that once seemed to shelter our collective existence. But how did this condition of group life emerge, flourish, and then perhaps decay? Uh, is it possible that it was? Uh, how then do we write a history of territory as a central attribute of human society? Certainly we can research and write the history of particular territory. Uh, small or extended, city-states and vast empires of a Luxembourg or a Russia. But can we write a history of territory as such, of its idea and, and, and just as important as social practices and manifestations across time? And that's what I've attempted in this research. It is, it is an effort to understand in what ways the idea of territory or the depiction of it and the practicing of it has evolved over time and thus to provide a history for what I think has been the hitherto non-historicized. How have societies, sometimes states and nations, imagined and organized the segments of the globe's surface on which they've lived? Reconstructing that history, I believe, allows significant insights into human development. Territory, after all, has been a basic social invention. Territories allow people to be governed or taxed or imbued with political loyalty by virtue of their shared spatial location, not by their race or their kinship ties or their faith or their professional affiliation. Territorial frontiers supposedly establish the reach of legal authority and of economic and social policy and the official use of language. Frontiers control the entry and sometimes exit of residents or travelers, goods, money, and even occasionally, though less successfully, of ideas. People tend to divide over whether they should be made more absolute or more porous. Robert Frost, the famous poem, thought that something there is that doesn't love a wall. But his neighbors stubbornly believed that good fences make good neighbors. We have usually divided over that alternative, sometimes raising the fences, sometimes making them more permeable. Territory, of course, has been a basic a property of statehood. As Max Weber wrote in perhaps his most famous formula, the state is the community that successfully claims a monopoly of legitimate capacity for force within defined area, and the area is integral to the definition. Political scientists have spent much time parsing the notion of monopoly of force or of legitimacy. They haven't really looked at the uh, notion of territory to the same extent. To control territory is to exercise uh, sovereignty. Uh, Schmidt, with whom I started, his reflections on the international order followed, in fact, his theories of sovereignty by about a decade. Sovereignty within individual states, such as his celebrated dictum of the mid-1920s, that sovereignty belonged to the person or agency that could decide the state of exception, that moment of political action when a ruler acts outside codified procedure and redefines legal power. 
But territory, as we know, also confers economic rights, even as it defines political sovereignty. Establishing territory transforms global space into a fundamental resource for public and private appropriation of wealth and revenues, for taxation, or for enjoying the profits from land and labor and technological improvements. Rousseau identified the importance of territory for the regime of property in his discourse on the origins of inequality. Well, the first man who, having fenced off a plot of land, thought of saving, saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe it, was the real founder of civil society. Thus, territorialization is the foundation of our political and economic life. And since antiquity, here is of international law tried to separate conceptually the political control of landed territory from the right to exploit a leaf, a piece of land, and all its inhabitants, there were debates over that, the right to exploit them economically, that is as, as a source of revenue and surplus. Indeed, the two dimensions of domination have flowed into each other. Rights of conquest could confer the rights of economic domination. Conversely, proprietors could supposedly purchase political sovereignty <coughs> from those who held, held it. The age of empire, say, since the 16th, uh, maybe the 20th century, was an era in which sovereignty or at least the subsidiary rights it provided could be bought and sold or leased. Consider Guantanamo today, a notorious site which the United States controls in many ways, but is still a session from Cuba. In what follows, I will sketch some of the ways political and economic control has evolved and changed over half a millennium. Chronologically, the book starts with territorial frontiers as a search for sovereignty. Then it moves toward the ideas of exploiting the interior for mobilizing economic surplus, whether through rights to land or labor. This entails a fiscal story, one that oscillated and perpetually oscillates between crisis and stabilization. Thereafter, I follow a third transformation of global space that ensued from the impact of transportation and communication technologies, which went hand in hand with the emergence of modern nationalism and ultimately on to a phase of global rivalry that was characterized by imperialism, world wars, and the Cold War. I begin my story in the 15th century with the confluence of at least four momentous developments that profoundly impacted the emergence of modern territoriality. First, the age of encounters between Europeans and the New World. Second, the decision, division inside Latin Christianity that entailed the rise, rise of Protestantism. Third, the insights into spatiality embodied within Renaissance perspective and modern cartography. And fourth, the so-called military revolution with the catalytic rise of artillery. The first two developments reshaped what might be called the space of empires. The latter two redefined what I call the space of states, although states include empires. As was the first to the fourth century AD, the 16th century was an epoch in which empires dominate the political organization of the world. Ming China, Mughal India, Safavid Persia, the Ottoman realm, from the Maghreb to the Danube, the emerging Muscovite Empire, the Habsburg ter uh, territories from the Philippines to the Andes, and Mexico to Spain, much of Italy, and to the Danubian lands of Central Europe. The 16th century. This is uh, Charles V, who is a Spanish sovereign and thus heir that controls the, all those uh, colonial lands as well as the sovereign uh, in <coughs> uh, Central Europe. And the Spanish holdings include uh, much of Italy as well. Uh, the Ottomans, that roughly you know, their greatest extent. And this is Ortelius, who was a wonderful atlases. Uh, uh, this is his view of, of Asia, but you see large in China, Hindustan, Arab, Persia, Russia's up there. It's an approximate map, but it's <laughs> <laughs> well, He did two atlases, one of the modern world, but he also did an atlas of Aeneas's world, a myth, a mythological. Uh, add to these possessions the Portuguese coastal holdings on all continents. <clears throat> soon the overseas possessions of the Dutch, British, and French. But empires have a distinctive form of territoriality. 
They are hardly cohesive, but they're rather multi-ethnic with large areas of only nominal authority, and they draw resources often from only a portion of their land masses. Their elites, their churches, and indeed their provinces claim ancient exemptions from taxes. Imperial propagandists make vast theoretical claims about rule and domination but are often content with nominal recognition and tribute. They propagate universalist ideas, uh, often religious faiths, but are challenged from within by sects and schisms. Uh, between 1520 and the mid-1550s, the German lands underwent a civil war arising from Protestant uh, uh, challenges. Uh, these quarrels resumed in the second decade of the 17th century over the precarious and contested balance of power between the Habsburg dynasty and its Catholic loyalists on one hand, the Spanish <coughs> Protestants on the other. Imperial sovereignty in some is extensive but spongy, Swiss cheese-like, with many enclaves of privileges and autonomy tied to location and ethnicity. The age of discoveries would lead to expanded claims of sovereignty, supported in the Spanish and Portuguese case by the Roman Catholic Church. But the expansive notions of sovereignty outrun the material and outran the material basis for enforcing it. Empires find it a difficult challenge to penetrate territory deeply. Large territories must be run by those powerful on the land. Territorial control remains conditional and precarious. Its holder reassured, as in China, perhaps by tribute, ceremony, and deference, undermined by the difficulty of tapping resources and the new costs of warfare imposed by effective artillery, firearms, fortresses, and the protracted sieges that increasingly mark the conduct of war, east and west. They can decompose either at the center or in the province. At the courts, corruption, favoritism, the politics of the harem, or the rivalry of advisors undercut the emperor. By the 1630s and 40s, much of the world seemed caught up in simultaneous wars and rebellions as states, both imperial and smaller, faced financial exhaustion and became prey to aristocratic factions, committed often to religious reform or reaffirmation and seeking to dominate monarchs who insisted on obedience but were way overstretched. In the early modern period, empire is prevalent, but it's always vulnerable. Historians have focused, therefore, on multiple tensions, the infighting of courts, the class tensions involved in agrarian production, uh, growing ideological dissent, regional conflicts, and the general divisions between a sophisticated elite plugged into the capital and provincial landlords, court versus country, often under the influence of religious zealotry. Territorial control provided the great resource of governance that kept them at bay when it did so. The problem was that the focus on territory itself could subtly undermine as well as excite the spirit of empire. Imperial space, in a sense, really should be expansive, although much imperial history involves the long, slow shrinkage of territory. Think about Byzantium. There have always been hawks in the capital, however, who insist that not an inch can be yielded lest the structure collapse. Empires should transcend territory, but that is increasingly difficult. This maritime empire provide immunity from the territorial extension, uh, extensions of landed empire. Transoceanic empire avoids the continuing tension with landed magnates, but presents daunting problems of its own. Overseas empire is in effort to mobilize wealth through trade or extraction. In those cases where the imperial power penetrates the countryside, the soldiers who administer it are given vast land and holdings and privileges over indigenous labor. Overseas empire allows powers with little European hinterland to gain great prosperity, and thus attracts state players who have been relatively marginal and peripheral to continental land masses. Portugal, the Netherlands, uh, and England, torn by religious and domestic conflict, and Castile and Leon, just emerging into primacy in the Iberian Peninsula and the late but overseas empire does not remain immune from the prevailing insecurity of ambitious statehood. The in oceans, in theory, are deemed, uh, that is in international law, to be a territorial commons where all nations should enjoy free access. But this hardly means that the seas were a realm of peace. 
Rather, they were deemed to become a Hobbesian realm where predatory behavior must be taken for granted, as summarized by the formula, no peace beyond the line, the line being the lines of papal arbitration between the Spanish and Portuguese. Thus, the oceanic dimension of imperial assemblages adds to the continuing sense of insecurity that characterizes imperial space. The oceans can't be expropriated as <coughs> a territory, but neither can they be accepted as tranquil, and conflict is understood to be endemic. Thus, they present a, a twilight legal regime and conspire against security. Uh, the Dutch Admiral von Rader writes in 1670, one is at the frontier here and never assured against the cunning of white and other nations and does not know when they will implement some devious plot. Even if formally there should exist a regime of so-called freedom of the seas, which is a demand obviously that goes way into the 20th century, uh, uh, it does not exclude the effort by maritime powers such as the Dutch in Southeast Asia uh, to pressure coastal sultans to grant them monopoly trading rights. The sea, therefore, is a frontier region, a no man's land that licenses empires of a new sort. It thus adds to the restlessness of imperial frontier concept. We face a contradiction that's hard to resolve. Imperial space is inherently unstable. The imperial spatial imaginary is driven and restless. But on the other hand, empires are among our most long-lasting institutional creations. Rome, China, if counted dynasty by dynasty, the feckless Habsburgs, the Ottomans, all hanging around for centuries, torn between triumph and past, ever self-interrogating about decline, fearing it and denying it. Uh, as American pundits do today, as Paul Kennedy made his fame by doing, but surviving nevertheless until they don't. In fact, the space of empires is as much a mental construct as it is a territorial one, a condition in which the extensiveness of frontiers defines the self-worth of the political class and is doomed to oscillate between tri triumphalist perceptions and convictions of imminent decay. And, uh, obviously, we can perhaps find some relevance in our own, in our own time on this. Now, consider the alternative emergent institutions in a territorial state, usually organized around a dynastic family, whether elective or hereditary. It offers a new form of territory. Its rulers come out of the shadow of empire to claim sovereignty. In the territorial state, the frontier is also crucial in the 16th and 17th century, in part because the new organization emerges from the first centuries of ballistic and artillery development, the obsolescence of old walled cities with high walls, and the perceived need to design new forms. Uh, fortresses, which can resist iron cannonball and withstand long sieges. The strength of a fortress depends upon the quality of its plan rather than the thickness of its walls, argued Francesco di Giorgio Martini uh, in the late 15th century, the Sienese born architect who codified the new doctrine in his Trattato di Architettura Ingegnere e Arte Militare. These are the same engineering and military arts in the period, finished sometime after 1480. Uh, and as elaborated in theory and then practice over the course of the 16th century, these designs would lead to the star-shaped fortification so striking in architectural treatises, models, and today from aerial photographs. This is, uh, this is one of his more beautiful constructions, the Fortress of San Leo. Uh, uh, the, the, the bastions, the round things, this is all the, the, the uh, as, uh, the wall bent in the middle for crossfire. These are all parts of the uh, of the new doctrine of uh, it was iron cannonballs that required. It's not gunpowder came earlier, but the stuff that was fired was just tough and stone shattered without much, doing much effect. Once people learned how to make iron cannonballs, then you had to redo the whole these whole systems on the front. And they were done on frontiers. This is uh, now here's a fortress utopia. I've lost track of who decided, but you'll notice this. This is the this is the, the treatises are filled with these. The, uh, the, uh, the the bastions project so that the, a crossfire from the top can uh, can hit people who are trying to besiege the fortress. There's room for an ideal city within the star-shaped uh, little fortress within the big fortress is there as the last recourse, and but it's there as you'll see to re 
to, to dominate the internal city as well. <coughs> you'll go to Florence, you'll see a fortress across the Arno, the Belvedere, and a fortress down below now used for commercial expositions. And they, the Medici put them there as much to protect themselves from uh, their populations as they did from Uh, uh, we get to Vauban, uh, and we can follow the developments of the fortifications from the wars over Italy between France and the Holy Roman Empire, the development of techniques such as bastion and walls in southern Italy, then in the Low Countries where the Spanish were contesting the Dutch Protestant rebels, they were involved in the south and Naples as well, also along the Danube where Habsburgs faced Ottomans, and above all on the French frontier and in the New World. What is emerging is a new geometry for the state. Uh, Renaissance architects in uh, Italy, uh, a century later, Descartes and Vauban in France and the Lowlands will devote their spatial insights to the frontiers they guard. Territory both within and on its ed edge is envisaged in terms of the potential for military resistance. These are the uh, map of, uh, of, the, of the forts on the, uh, on, the, on the edge of the frontiers put by Vauban who was a real, wonderful reader, he was a real workaholic. And his minister of war, Lou Ma, was a real workaholic too. And of course, they had a harsh taskmaster. And Lou Ma writes, Vauban writes to Lou Ma, you know, if you didn't badger me with questions all the time, I might get something more done. And uh, so the, these, these, Vauban's 